Thank you, Jesse. Thank you. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone to our two-part discussion of what's happening in state professional development. Um, I'm really thrilled that we're here online together today um, to hear from our colleagues in two states, um, from Washington State and from North Carolina. I'd like to introduce our guests. We have Cindy Wilson, Policy Associate, Associate for Adult Basic Education um, with the Washington State Board for Community and Technical College. Colleges. She is here with her colleague, um, Will Durden, who is the Policy Associate for Basic Ed for Adults with IBEST, also from Washington State. From North Carolina, we have Nancy Guy. She is the Director, um, Program and Professional Development, College and Career Readiness in the North Carolina Community College System Office. This webinar kicks off our two-part discussion. So starting with this webinar, we are going to explore some successes and challenges in staff development with thanks to our guests for helping us get the conversation started. They will share their work, but we will also have an opportunity to interact, which I will get to in a moment. After the webinar, we will be online in the evidence-based professional development group with follow-up discussions. So which is questions that um, the questions that we don't get to today, we will definitely be able to address them all in the evidence-based professional development group. Part two of this series takes place again in a few weeks in February. Um, where again, we will reconvene for a webinar and online discussion, and we will hear from colleagues in Maine and Texas who will share their work. So our purpose today, um, we're going to hear from Washington State, who will kick it off for us, and um, share their work in team teaching and contextualized instruction. And then we will hear from uh, Nancy, to, who will share her work regarding North Carolina's credentialing project. Then we're going to do something a little different. We're going to um, break out into focused small group breakout discussions, where you will be in a small breakout room with nine other colleagues, and you will have the opportunity to share your work in the chat box and communicate in small groups to answer some very specific questions. We will then reconvene as a large group to discuss the hot issues that um, stood out in your small group discussions and talk about next steps, with the idea being that how can we as staff developers best support one another in our work going forward um, in 2015. Let's move over to a poll question first. We'd like to know who we have in the room. Um, so with the poll that we're going to launch here in a second, please answer this question. What is your primary role in state professional development? Terrific. Okay. All right, terrific. So we have um, a little over half of us are professional development providers. We have about 20% um, of us who are in the other category. So I'm not sure what that is, but I'd be really anxious to see um, all the different roles that are not listed um, where we have representation. And we have, looks like 16% of us are primarily participants in staff development. We have a great mix. Thank you very much. Okay. I'd like for us to take a few minutes now, if you have some scratch paper nearby, a notepad or something, these are the questions we're going to address in greater depth when we get into small groups. And I'd like first to take a moment to think about it now. 
please jot down at least one to two major initiatives in your state professional development. And what is your role in that? Are you just are you a participant? Um, are you a teacher leader, a planner, um, and so forth? Second, think about what what is one professional development success you are proud of. It could be an initiative in which you helped design or deliver, or it could be an initiative in which you participated and you implemented some of what you've learned through staff development in your work um, with some positive results. And then third, what is the greatest challenge you face in providing or participating in professional development, or both? Take a moment to write down your thoughts. Terrific. We're going to revisit this a little bit later today, so keep those notes handy. Now I'm going to turn the webinar over to Will and Nancy, Will and Cindy, who are going to share their work um, in professional development in Washington State. Great. Thank you. And first of all, I just have to say football has been very good to me this year. Um, yes, I'm alumni from the Ohio State University National Champs. I saw some um, chatter about that, and not only that, but as you may have all seen yesterday, the Seahawks are on their way yet again to the Super Bowl. I apologize to the Green Bay Packer fans out there, or to the, let's see, who is it we're playing? Um, Patriots, thank you, Will. <laughs> Will, my colleague who says he doesn't follow football. But anyway, um, welcome this afternoon, and we're happy to be here and to share with you a little bit about what we do around professional development in Washington State. I'd like to give you a little bit of an overview of just how it's organized here in Washington, um, how our funding works and, and the oversight and the, the delivery for, for actual PD in the state. Um, the, as far as funding goes, we have a variety of ways, profession, ways professional funding is um, run. We, the main thrust of it is our federal leadership grants are set aside and um, then each of our providers have an opportunity to apply for funding through a grant system. It's a non-competitive, so they say what they're planning to do around professional development and they have access to those funding. And each program provider has a limited amount of funding for that. Um, and out of that funding has to come their compliance um, professional development, so any professional development around um, our assessment system or our data for program improvement, things, things like that. So they have required things that they need to fund through that funding. And then they have additional PD funding, which we'll be talking about two initiatives here um, with IBEF and with our uh, contextualization. There's also um, professional development done with state dollars. So our state, our system is run through the community and college system, and so there are state funds available for professional development um, in addition um, to our federal dollars. We also run um, each year a competitive process where folks will uh, put forth ideas and projects that they would like to work on, and that's supported at a little bit higher rate um, in only this year, I think we're running 15 or 16 of those specially funded grants for additional training. So that's a little bit about our funding model. The oversight is done strictly through the State Board for Community and Technical Colleges. And um, so that is our oversight and works really well because we have just kind of a one point of contact. Um, we're in charge of development, developing and then um, implementing all the professional development within the state for adult basic education for adults. Um, the delivery model, the delivery has been a variety of ways, but the one that seems to be working really well for our state right now is to get folks from the field, uh, those uh, faculty, directors, staff, they're out on the front lines, and bring them, um, con basically run a small contract with them, and um, they provide then the 
the training that goes out to the field. And um, so we do that. And then we also uh, partner with Lynx. And currently, our state is running um, their numeracy project. And that's a three workshop, a, a workshop three for each quarter. And we're running two sessions currently. And so that's provided great feedback on that. And um, faculty tend to be getting a lot out of that. That helps us move initiatives, the math initiative forward. So we look at whatever initiative is, is happening in our state, look at how we're, we're going to develop training around that, and then to implement that training. And so many of you know about um, Washington State's IBEST. And I'm going to turn it over to Will now. And he's going to talk a little bit about um, what we're doing around professional development in IBEST. Okay, thanks, Cindy, for that wonderful introduction. Hello, everybody. I hope you're all well. <clears throat> My voice is just a little bit less than it usually is, so I'm a little scratchy, so I hope you can hear me okay. I'll try to speak clearly. Yeah, as Cindy mentioned, a few of you might have heard of IBEST before. It's been kind of a big, a big deal for Washington State, and so that was an initiative. Uh, just as a brief overview, that was an initiative that was designed to improve outcomes for ABE ESL students. Uh, by contextualizing education and getting those students into some career tech classrooms right away, earning uh, that credit, um, instead of waiting in ABE until they finished all their levels. So it was a way to accelerate learning and get people going um, into some college and career pathways that really paid off for them. So when we first developed IBEST way back in 2005 here in Washington State, we had a small grant and we did some research. And that research was really critical for us because it led to the creation of a team teaching model. Uh, team teaching is not necessarily a, a natural or, or an instinctive thing to do. And so you don't just throw two people in the classroom and find out that they just know everything to do with each other. And so once we did the research and found out that there were certain ways of team teaching that were more effective than other ways, and that there were a range of ways to team teach, we saw that there was a real need for professional development. And so we've created a whole, a whole series of professional development opportunities to support team teaching. Uh, using the cadre model. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. We really have two trainings. We have a new teacher training where we just get some new teaching teams back, or some new teaching teams into the fold of how to team teach. And then we have a team teaching cadre. And there's where we take our experienced team teachers who've already received initial training, bring them back into the fold, give them some expert training, and now they are trainers for the field. And really, that leads us to our successes and challenges. And our big success, I think, has been the faculty-led training piece. Our teachers are, are into this model. They understand the benefit. Most people, once they start team teaching, say they never want to go back. And so we've got that great faculty buy-in when we're saying, hey, we'd like you to run these trainings. They're saying, yes, please, we'd love to take that piece and do that. So that's been a, a big success. The challenge, and really just something that we've learned through some trial and error, and so we've got some good trial and error evidence working for us has been in the facilitation of training faculty. When it comes to facilitating these teaching team trainings, we found that we've got a little bit of work there. And what we found, this takes us already into our lessons learned, what we found is that having some state board oversight works best with these trainings. Even as the faculty lead the trainings, we still need a facilitator from the state board there actively engaged throughout the whole training. There's a few reasons for that, and we'll highlight those reasons for you. The first one is just for the integrity of the training, making sure that all of the components get covered no matter what. You know, I think of it as that performance. And sometimes in the moment you think, oh, that component doesn't feel as important right now, or I don't know if people really need this. But we've learned that we need to have the training be the same every single time no matter what. And so the state board facilitator is there to make sure that that happens. Tracking is really critical as well, too. I can't uh, highlight this one enough. We need to know what's going on from training to training. Where are there issues where maybe a component needs some revision? Uh, where, you know, where are things succeeding? Where are things falling flat? Um, what's the response from faculty? And so rather than trying to get reports from our faculty trainers who are very busy and, and working on just kind of day contract situations, if we're there, we can make that tracking happen. And then finally, just the sustainability. And I think this ties back with integrity. But just of making sure that we have the same training that we offer every time, making sure that it's on a schedule, that it's on a pace, um, all of those things that make any one training successful and being able to duplicate and replicate those every single time. So we found that that oversight at the state board level really helps to ensure all of that. 
And that, that, those teacher trainings, both the new teacher training and the train the trainer cadre training, have really been the core of professional development for IVEP uh, over the past several years. So we're at a spot now, actually, to get into kind of current needs and future direction where we've started to plan some additional professional development. I believe we have some really well-trained faculty and some really stellar faculty. And what we started to realize is that we needed more professional development for administrators. So you have all these faculty who've been trained in, in the models, and then you have a dean or a director walking into a classroom saying, I don't know what these people are doing. What, is, what does team teaching look like? So college administration needs to know how team teaching works. That way, deans and directors can better evaluate and coach and support teaching teams. And if they're trained in the models, then they can also help us to maintain integrity. So we get a little bit of that buy-in at the college, at the institution level. We're all working on maintaining the integrity of the models together because we've all been trained in it. Another need that we have is that the college and career readiness standards need to be integrated into the training. So our state's fully on board with the CCRs, and you know we've got people already, already using them in spots. We're kind of in this transition period. And so we need to move from our Washington, Washington State learning standards, which we've been integrating into our curriculum for a long time, and we need to move over to the CCRs. So that's a piece that needs to be developed uh, sooner rather than later. And in terms of future directions, we're continuing to scale IBEST up. So it kind of went from the initiative to the program level. Now we're trying to take it from the program level really up to this is how we do business in, in adult education. Um, and so we're continually looking for some new training opportunities for deans and directors to help support that direction. That's my piece in a nutshell, and I'm going to take it back to Cindy here. Great. Thanks, Will. Um, and we'll be taking questions um, as time permits at the end of our presentation here. So the next one I'd like to talk a little bit about is, um, and this is a new initiative, we, we mentioned that you know, we kind of start a new initiative, and then we look at how what training is needed in the field to sustain that and grow it. Um, many of you, I'm sure, are aware of the IBEST project, but this new one just started about two years ago, full force last year, and that was contextualized instruction for High School 21. And what, um, I'll, I'll just give you a brief overview about what the project is, but really want to talk more about what the professional development that went around that piece. What the High School 21 initiative was, it was in response to, as you all know, the ability to benefit had gone away at that time. Now we've got it back, but at that time, um, students no longer had the ability to benefit option for going to college. And seeing that um, really impacting our students' ability to get into that college programming. Then we also were faced with the changes in the GED. Um, and so looking at that and, and knowing that they're going to need some kind of um, high school diploma or a GED certificate or some kind of uh, evidence of a high school spurred us on to what are we going to do for our students. Um, and then we had the college and career readiness standards that was perfect timing because those identified ways that students would become then college ready. Uh, so with all of those components looked at there needs to be a shift in, in, in our instruction. And our shift was to contextualize our instruction in subject matters that then could lead to or result in the students receiving a high school credential in our ABE programming. So now students can come to our community colleges and be able to take courses through their adult basic education program and receive credit that then can apply towards their high school diploma. Um, so colleges are awarding their high school, um, high school diplomas and students are then um, being able to access financial aid and we have a state need grant here in Washington too. So this um, high school 21 was an opportunity to open those doors that kind of had the squeeze closed a little bit for our students. Um, and I'll be happy to answer questions about that, um, the program, but let's move on to how we implemented professional development for this. First of all, we took um, three faculty from, um, in addition to the state board staff um, to two trainings on college and career readiness standards. Um, we looked at what are the graduation requirements for the K-12 system, so we were made, made sure we aligned all of our curriculum up with those standards and requirements. Looked at the GED changes because we still had a lot of faculty that, um, and we're a GED state obviously, 
um, a lot of faculty saying, how are we going to get our students through this, the requirements of the new GED? And developed a training based on and pretty much those things, on the college and career readiness standards, what is needed for high school diploma, and then the changes around GED. In 2013 and 14, we started with the cadre sessions um, like we were trying to implement with um, IBEST, and then we also have done the cadre um, format and other other initiatives too. But I'll talk a little bit about uh, more about that cadre thing and how that played out for us. Um, and then in addition to cadres, and this was to well, the, let me back up a minute. The two-day cadre was to have the goal was to have two faculty at each institution that would then carry the message to their institution and carry the training to their institution. Um, and we backed that up then with six one day, just faculty only sessions. And those sessions were developed just so that faculty um, would take it back to their own classroom and implement contextualized instruction at their particular institution. Um, successes. Well, it was well received by the faculty. Um, we had uh, 12 programs, over 200 diplomas were issued, um, and 12 programs, that means 12 providers that embrace the High School 21. Now we probably have, um, there's 34 colleges in our system. We probably have close to half of them at this point that have embraced the High School 21 um, initiative. Over 200 faculty were trained, and um, so that was encouraging to see them really taking this back and implementing this in their, their uh, classrooms and to be able to see students being awarded their high school diplomas through it. Challenges, we currently have no challenges at this time. Um, in fact, um, we're running a training uh, last week of January and um, the minute the training registration went out, it was full. And so it's very well received and moving forward right now really well, and, and that's exciting. Some lessons learned, um, as Will mentioned, state, um, state board oversight is critical. Um, if you don't, we found that if there's not a single point of contact, it opens up to drift. And although you think you send a really clear message and you send the direction you want to head, um, it seems like it's that old telephone game, you know, where you tell the story and then it gets changed each time someone else tells the story. So being able to have a consistent format for our trainings is, is critical, and having state board oversight um, allows for that. The cadre, or train the trainers, for this particular initiative wasn't as effective as we would have liked. And I think, I have some of my own, I think the challenge there was that faculty came and they got all jazzed about the training and implementing and then they would go back and they did a great job implementing in their own classroom, but life started happening. They had their own classrooms to see it contend with and there wasn't the time to train their own faculty at their institution. Uh, so I think that was a challenge to, to think that they were going to take that training back um, to their institution and you also open yourself up for drift. Um, again, that they just don't um, train exactly on the format that you'd like to see happen. The other lesson learned was we had thought we had developed this one because you get a bunch of faculty together and they're really excited about sharing lesson plans and, and all the activities that they're doing around the particular project or what have you and then um, come to find out we open up a Canvas site, got everybody to log things in and it was not used to the level that we would have liked. Um, we're looking now at maybe doing some things around open source resource, open course resources or some other format, um, not using the Canvas site. Maintaining that became a challenge, making sure that um, it was organized in a fashion that was useful for, for our faculty. Current needs and future direction, um, we are in a transition year with WIOA that um, we will be transitioning to the contextualized um, in, in college and career pathways. Uh, and then we will be looking at the learning standards and transitioning from Washington State learning standards to college and career readiness standards. And then um, looking on, again, uh, WIOA is, is driving some of this initiative, and that's the contextualized, contextualization of job skills. 
and making sure that that instruction is delivered in the classroom. And also looking forward to those NRS um, standards and what that's going to look like and how it might impact our contextualized training. And that concludes, I don't, I'm not sure where we're at with time, so um, that concludes mm -hmm. our presentation. If we have time for a few questions, happy to entertain those. Thank you, Cindy, and thank you, Will. Yes, we definitely have time for questions, and uh, we've had a few um, come in through the chat, but if others have questions, please post them in the chat room now. Um, the first question, um, Cindy and Will, um, that was raised was, um, do you have standards in learning for K through 12? Yes, we are Common Core State, so we have a our state has adopted the Common Core, and um, those, and, and we have a state that requires, they have graduation requirements. So that's where we started aligning um, that up with our K-12 system. Okay, great, thank you. Um, another question that was raised was um, during the discussion of the new GED and the GED changes. Um, so, now that we know, the question is, now that we know how fewer students are passing the new GED, what do the numbers look like in Washington State? Has that been your experience as well? Actually, I was just at a meeting this morning, and no, it has not been the experience here in Washington. What a 70% right, Will? 71% pass rate. Um, so, you know, part of me is like rah, rah, rah for contextualization um, instruction that hopefully that's making, um, has, has had a positive impact on that. Excellent. Thank you. That's good news to hear. Definitely. Um, another recent question that's come in, um, so are the numbers of people sitting for the test the same? I think that's related question. You know, I, I, I don't know. Um, that's kind of not quite my world, so um, I, I can't answer that. I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, we can certainly um, get to that in the online portion of the discussion. Maybe somebody who has that information could post it for us. Sure, I'd be happy um, to help. Thank you. Um, the next question, um, you said that contextualized said that you contextualize the um, HS21 instruction in subject matter that can result in a high school diploma. What exactly were the subject areas? That's from Jane Miller. Great, great question. So um, for our state, we have to have current world problems, which dovetailed nice with the GED and social studies piece. Um, there's science classes. There's different amounts of credit for each of the content. So you have a science requirement credits for science, and so the way the, the model works is you would, as a faculty member, you would have students sitting in a classroom that maybe a third of them are there working for their GED and, and working through that content, and then maybe some of them, the rest of them, them working for their high school diploma in a science particular focus. Um, so they would, at the end of the class, they could either get their science credit or hopefully pass that coursework or the, the section of the GED for the science section. Um, so we looked at e and we took each requirement and the, high, the colleges have by law have the ability to issue high school diplomas. So although we married it up to a, um, Office of Public Instruction, OSPI here in Washington State, we have the freedom at the community college to offer high school diploma for students that are 21 and over, hence we have high school 21 plus. Um, so they can determine their own requirements, but we didn't want to skew from what is required from our, our state requirements too. The rigor is there. Um, these students are coming in and they're, they're, they're meeting the college entrance um, examinations. They're doing a great job, just an amazing work that's being done in those programs. Thank you, Cindy. Um, we've got two more questions I'm going to raise, and then um, we'll uh, uh, turn it over to Nancy. Um, one Jeff Fantine asks, um, he said that you made a comment that people went back to their program after the training and implemented their 
in our own classrooms well, but fail to really train other staff. So the question is, what evidence did you gather about their personal implementation of the training um, as I find that not the norm? For example, many people attending training activities and don't really change much as a result of about their practice. So he's um, wondering what you gathered to and that informed your comments. The the most we got the the biggest aha for us was the the evidence of integrating those college and career readiness standards and the fact that they were able the colleges were then able to issue credits for their high school diploma. Had they not changed their instructional um, way of doing things, colleges would not have been able to um, award that credit because they, colleges are ultimately responsible for issuing um, that credit and their diplomas. And so the fact that colleges were indeed able to do that signifies that there was a shift in the instructional modality. Um, the fact that, that folks are aware of the college and career readiness standards, we, we, were, we had our own state standards, and so our state was familiar with working with learning standards. Um, we are called the WALS, Washington, WA-LS, learning standards. Um, the WALS then, more people were saying, oh, but we've moved to college and career readiness standards. And so just as you, you spoke with faculty, do we have any hard, um, I mean, other than the amount of diplomas issued uh, would be the only data, per se, that we have on it. Okay, terrific. Um, we're going to raise one more question, Cindy and Will, and then we'll we'll come back to the remaining questions if there's time at the end. If not, we'll definitely transition them to the online conversation. Um, but Diane Verso asks, did you find that the professional development needs vary by region? Um, if so, how do you accommodate for that? Great question. Um, mm, I don't know that the needs vary per region, but the way we've accommodated is we do do regional training. Um, we do have a set of mountains that divides our state, which sometimes you wonder how challenging can those mountains be, but obviously sometimes they're pretty challenging. So folks, um, we run eastern trainings, western trainings, north and south trainings. Um, so we try to hit the various regions pretty much the issues and challenges are the same. Um, some have a few more off-site campus sites. We have a few CBOs that, that kind of have some unique challenges, but they've been able, they've been working with the colleges long enough that they've been able to adapt their instruction um, to, what, to the training. Corrections has, um, some of our correction facilities have, it's been a little more challenging for those folks because they just don't have the technology and things available in the classroom as, as the colleges and CBOs do. Okay, terrific. Thank you so much. Um, we're going to go ahead and transition now uh, to Nancy Guy um, and hear about uh, the North Carolina uh, professional development with respect to teacher credentialing for basic skills instructors. Nancy, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm awfully happy to be here this afternoon, and since Cindy started off by saying something about um, football, um, I did not graduate from a football school. I graduated from a basketball school, but at Duke University, we've had three winning seasons, so in our book, that makes it a football school. That being said, um, I want to talk a little bit about the kind of an overview for, for how we um, provide professional development in North Carolina. And what we have a rather large system that uh, we work with. We have 58 community colleges. We have 19 community-based organizations. Um, and we provide most of what we do Regionally, we do have webinars. We do have some locally provided professional development. We have regional symposiums. And 
the way we get all this done is really through our own expertise at the state level and through coordinating uh, and managing and leading quite a few uh, professional development contracts. I do have the, the good fortune in my section to have a team of subject matter experts who are devoted to uh, program and professional development. This right, the slide that you can see now really gives you an idea of the scope of our state and that particular graphic simply indicates for you the locations of the main campuses that we have. What I faced when I came into this job uh, three years ago was that we have almost 4,000 instructors, only 400 of whom are full-time. That presents a real challenge for us. Um, and it also means that when we work to provide things, for them, we have to think in terms of the kinds of partnerships that we can develop to make everything as accessible as possible. Um, when I came into the, to this particular role, we had about 25% of our instructors had any type of certification. And shortly after I came, uh, NRS let us know that they wanted us to begin collecting information on the certifications that our instructors had and not wanting North Carolina to look bad and knowing that we were doing an awful lot but we did not seem to be getting any credentials out of it. Uh, I really learned a lot from all the conversations about career pathways and about stackable credentials and all those conversations that really had to do with serving students. Um, but they began to kind of seep into the mind of, of my team in thinking about how we were going um, to begin to think about professional development. I indicated that we work through partnerships, but I do have, uh, like I said, subject matter experts on my staff. And I'm just going to mention them to you in their areas of expertise. I have Dr. Cassandra Atkinson, uh, who works in the area of transitions and uh, Basic Skills Plus, our North Carolina model for integrating uh, basic skills and occupational training. I have Karen Brown, who is our coordinator for all work done in ESOL training as well as EL Civics. And I have uh, Amy Cook, who is responsible for the professional development we do in adult basic education as well as adult secondary education. And last but not least, Dr. Trudy Hughes, who is responsible for our initiatives. And this is new for us in serving students with special learning needs, most particularly intellectual and learning disabilities. So our state staff does quite a bit in the field, but we do have um, 22 contractual partnerships. Um, and it's very important who these partnerships are with. We do have a lot of our core training, meaning training for adult basic education and adult secondary education, provided through the Reich School of Education uh, in their adult basic skills professional development project. We also have a significant contract with a um, national nonprofit that happens to be based in North Carolina called Mother Reed, and they do training for us in contextualizing um, a variety of topics. We work also with several of our community colleges and community-based organizations to have subject matter experts who may in fact be on their staff work with us um, actually as trainers. So with that in mind, we developed as a team a system that we wanted to bring a lot of the pieces together and see what we could do to come up with a credentialing system. We had tried some things that were portfolio based in the past, um, but we had very, very small participation in those efforts. So what we wanted to do was really improve student performance by raising the quality of instruction, as you can see from the slide. We set out, even though we have a very large system, the third largest in the country, we wanted to provide a comprehensive system for instructors at various levels of expertise and experience. We also wanted to incentivize and professionalize the system. 
we do not require that people attend professional development. It is encouraged, but because it is not required, we had to do something, we felt, to incentivize and professionalize uh, our instructor's experience. We also did the research not only in the field, but from a variety of subject matter, other experts and researchers to figure out what are the best evidence-based methodologies that we can use and that are most necessary in the basic skills classroom environment uh, in ABE, ASE, and ESL. And we hoped that we would have a, an infrastructure developed, not just the professional development course, but opportunity for um, follow-up in the classroom through our trainers. So we wanted to have an infrastructure model. What we came up with um, were several certificates. The first one we refer to as the core. Uh, the core is actually six face-to-face -face courses and one online orientation course when you see these um, hyperlinks, if you were to click, you could go and actually see a worksheet that describes to you in more detail that particular certificate. Because of the importance of um, evidence-based reading and teaching reading with the necessary components that, that the federal government has identified, we continue to provide a special, what we call a specialty training in reading, which is uh, the STAR training. The next specialty certificate we developed was in adult secondary, and because of the variety of things that both Cindy and Will have referred to about the changing landscape in secondary education, we felt it was important to allow people to have courses, take courses that were based on content standards. Uh, we did have a very lengthy process, a six-year process in North Carolina of developing our own content standards and then integrating them with national standards, both those for K-12 and um, also those from Octay. So that enabled us to have content standards-based training from the very beginning. And as a result, we've allowed people to be more focused in their adult secondary preparation. They may want to get the specialty certificate in just math and science, or they may want to get the specialty certificate just in language arts and social studies, because we do have, in um, numerous of our programs, we have an adult high school diploma program offered in conjunction with local LEAs, and so it's important that we be able to teach those skills, those content areas that are being taught in public schools now, and that will be accepted as part of a high school diploma. The most recent um, rollout certificate came for us in the ESOL. And what we do there is our content person in that area, Karen Brown, pulled together a hybrid model using links, online coursework, and face-to-face -face sessions. So people will attend one of these link sessions, uh, put their certificate when they've successfully completed into a Dropbox and then they'll be able to use that Dropbox certification. It triggers their ability to register in a face-to-face -face course. Um, and looking at my notes, what I did not say is when I, I mentioned that we had these various evidence-based courses in the core, um, they do include, that certificate includes evidence-based reading, math, writing, how to contextualize the instruction, particularly around work, how to teach online and use instructional technology in the classroom, um, assessment to instruction, and applying content standards. So from the very beginning, applying content standards has been a part of, of what we have offered. How it works, uh, you see there the graphic of the, of the person looking like she's finished college, and that has a lot to do with um, our one partner I have not yet talked about, NC State University, we decided that in order to incentivize and professionalize this system, it would be really important to raise the uh, profile, if you will, of the, the certification process. So we wanted it to feel as much like um, participating in college coursework as possible. So what we did is we developed, which is available online at our website, a professional development course catalog you can actually go at this particular link that I have indicated here and 
click on a link to enroll through North Carolina State University. Uh, it gives you the um, outline. It tells you the objectives of the course. It tells you the purpose of the course, the content standards that are covered in the course. It shows you the multiple locations throughout the year in which it will be offered, and um, you sign up that way. What that has for us as a, as a real benefit is it means that we have a university-maintained database, and we have a transcript retrieval system through the university. So if someone in the middle of the night, God forbid, can't remember if they finished four courses or five, and they want to find that out, they can simply go into the NC State Continuing Education uh, Professional Development website and take a look at what they've taken. Um, we do actually distribute uh, periodically certificates, either in the core, adult secondary, ESL, or STAR. Um, we'd like to present these um, at big events if we can during the year, but all too often it seems that people don't want to wait that long to receive their certificate, so they will simply be mailed to their directors. Um, the next thing that I want to make sure I leave you with is I'm very excited about what we've done in North Carolina because we have a lot of pieces here. We have a lot of quality staff. We have a... Um, a big territory to cover. We have a lot of really strong program people, but we didn't have anything that pulled that all together and helped the instructors benefit and the administrators and ultimately the students benefit. So we've had an awful lot of success uh, since we've implemented this. We've had extensive participation. All of our community-based organizations and community colleges have sent someone to some course. Um, at any one time, there are 2,000 people accessing these courses, as in signing up to take them. Um, as I mentioned, when I came in, we had 25% of our folks were um, credentialed. That number is now almost 50%, and that increase has come virtually completely, not from different hiring practices, but from people receiving a certification in adult ed through the community college system. We have created a new normal. There are higher expectations for instructors. We know with WIOA coming in, there are a lot of demands being made on instructors, and we want to make sure that we have prepared them um, in ways that we feel, feel good about and that and we know will lead to success. We also know that in professional development has improved our EFLs uh, for our students. Uh, we had a preliminary a study done by Dr. Kristen Corbell in which she took a look at uh, performance of students in classes where their instructors were credentialed compared with those who were not. Um, it wasn't an earth-shattering um, uh, significance, but it was, in fact, a marked significance uh, in the difference in performance, and we feel like that's very encouraging. We also like the fact as a success that we now have a standardized presentation process for evidence-based practices. We're not on a catch-as-catch-can basis or hoping someone will show up or listen to a webinar and maybe the presenter mentioned something or didn't. We want to make sure that, that we have a standardized way of presenting that. Um, and as I said before, one of our goals from the beginning was continuous improvement, and we feel like we're moving toward that. At the same time, we do have challenges uh, and needs, and there's some trends that, that we're having to keep up with. Uh, one, as was mentioned by my colleagues in Washington State, trying to incorporate uh, the emphases of WIOA into the credentialing system. Uh, we know that contextualization is extremely important, knowing how to help students transition. We know some of that happens in the classroom as well as outside. So those emphases need to be incorporated into what we do, and at the same time, the second item here, prioritizing new course development with limited resources, we cannot simply add more and more and more and more courses and expect that all of those are going to be able to be managed by us or staffed by us or contracted by us. So we have to, we're going to have to make some choices in this transition year and going forward. A tremendous challenge is to have full implementation in a voluntary system. The only thing that we really have going for us, which is a huge thing, 
is that this is excellent quality professional development. Uh, people do earn continuing education credit because it's offered through a university model they are able to earn CEUs. And for many of our folks who work part-time and actually have other jobs that require ongoing certification, this is a huge benefit. Um, but that is a challenge for us. How can we get more and more people to participate in something they do not have to do? Which leads really to the last um, point here, keeping positive momentum. Sometimes when you grow something, it's more successful than you thought it would be. And sometimes the challenge of success is being able to manage the success. I feel like we're at that point now. There are a lot of things that have been left out of our professional development. Um, and this slide is not meant to indicate drop in the bucket, but um, continuing influence. But I think one of the things that's difficult for us is, was mentioned earlier, we have instructors who've been extremely well trained, but then they go into programs where maybe there's a disconnect between administration and its needs and instructional needs. So um, that's one of our challenges. But we think, and if you look at this graphic, it makes it does make the point um, that you can basically segue and change and affect change by starting in one point. And that's what we're doing in North Carolina. Thank you, Nancy. Um, wow, that was really tied with information. Um, both both presentations have been, and we have a lot of questions uh, for you, Nancy, but we're not going to have time to get to them right this moment. I, I do want to ask one, because I don't want to leave us without asking you any questions, um, but then we'll need to, to move forward, and if we, as we have time at the end, you know, we can certainly raise them again. Um, the question that was asked in a couple of different ways, um, was the, the whole idea of incentives. So um, if the courses aren't mandatory, what's the incentive for practitioners to participate? Um, could you say more about that, um, that increased teacher buy-in and um, participation, particularly with those that were successful at reaching part-timers? Um, I think one of the things um, that that is an incentive is all of these things are offered free and they're offered usually within about an hour's driving distance of every instructor that we have. So it's professional development they know they need and they actually can access. We've made it very easy to access. The other thing, we have some of our programs, uh, whether they are CBOs or whether they're community colleges, who are requiring their instructors, and that's something they can do at the local level. Uh, they can require that their instructors attend, and they have seen the value of it to their programs, so many of them have elected to do that. We have a handful of programs that have actually begun to offer more money to people who are credentialed. So those are, I think, very important um, things that have happened. And as I mentioned before, the earning CEU credit is, is a nice thing to have on your resume. It's a nice thing to have when you're job hunting. It's nice if you're trying to get a promotion. Um, it shows you've taken part in something that's substantial for your own growth. Thank you, Nancy. Uh-huh. Okay, we're gonna transition to the next portion of our webinar um, where we will move into breakout rooms. Um, there will be about 10 people per room and you will be randomly assigned. Um, when, once you get into that room, you will know you're in the room because you will see the discussion questions posted in your breakout session. So we would just need one person to step forward in your group um, to claim the role of facilitator um, and our technology challenges that you have only the chat box to communicate. Um, unfortunately, it would um, be difficult to have a short focused discussion if we suddenly unmuted everybody and um, you know with background noise and, and so forth. But you all are staff developers, you understand how that goes. So again, randomly assigned, identify a facilitator. You'll know it's time to start when you see the questions and use the chat box to communicate. Hi everyone, sorry for the abrupt stop there, um, but we are saving um, the chat room discussion 
Um, so lots of great information was being shared. Um, thank you so much for um, participating in the small groups. I wanted to share, I know some of you had uh, some technical, well, we had technical issues getting started at first, but once the questions were displayed and some groups jumped right in, there were some really lively discussions. And just to give you a quick snapshot, you know, yes, Jeff, I tried to give a two-minute warning, but with um, a couple of dozen breakout rooms, it was a little challenging. We're sorry about that. But um, but maybe to see if we could go look at um, breakout 14 for uh, to see one example of some conversation. Yes, and um, we are going to talk about next steps in just a moment here. Uh, yes, Kat, I'm sorry that you didn't have a chance to talk out your own successes. I am curious, what did you guys think of that format, doing the breakout um, as an opportunity to talk? I know that there were some challenges in getting the conversations going, but for those of you that had conversations happening, um, what did you think? <laughs> Jeff Santin says he likes it. He'd love an entire session just on that. I agree, Jeff. Yeah, it, it was hard to read and respond. It reminds me of chat rooms. You know, it's, it's a chat room, so it's, you know, a little different way of, of proceeding. It has promised, Mark Johnson says. We liked it because Steve Snyder says we didn't talk over one another. Um, type fast and you get heard. <laughs> yeah, once it started going, definitely. Yeah, next time it will be easier. You know, and that is something to think about, too. In February 9th, when we restructure it, we can certainly allow for more time for the small breakouts if you if that is what you desire. OK, terrific. Well, we're running. I don't want us to run out of time. I want to be respectful of everyone's time. Uh, let's have some focused discussion here in this main room now. Based on some of the conversations you had in your small group, um, what were some of the pressing issues um, you faced in professional development or perhaps you heard others voice? Thanks, Rebecca. Meeting all the standards with limited resources to pay for PD time. That's uh, one of the pressing issues that Kat raised. Uh, intensive PD participation, the cost of certification. Great feedback. Incentives and buy-in time, lots of a lot around incentives. Yes, yeah, the whole issue of um, part-time, um, the challenges of being a part-time teacher and doing staff development. Okay. Face-to-face -face training should have follow-up reflection or reflection time. All of these topics, uh, we're going to 
you know, start addressing them in the evidence-based professional development group this week. And I know I can count on all of you to log in and to help continue these conversations. Accountability, accountability and follow-up. Terrific. Okay, next question. And you can continue to respond to the pressing issues you face um, now and in the online portion uh, throughout the week. Thinking about the pressing issues, you as staff uh, developers um, or those who provide professional development, what do you need to know and what support do you need in order to be as effective as possible in your role? Kathy says revisiting the components of effective PD would be helpful. I agree. Time. <laughs> Ongoing opportunities for learning with colleagues. Contacts who can assist with follow-up. Collaboration, Andy said, with other staff development professionals. <laughs> Cloning people always help if it would actually happen. That I agree, Deb. Access to colleagues outside of my state to collaborate and share. Uh -huh. Repository that works. Yes, Jeff, I agree. Okay, excellent. A uh, similar question, so how can we um, ask group members, community members um, from the evidence-based professional development group, how can we best support each other? So in thinking about the supports you need, what can we do as a community of practice? What do you want from me and what do you want from the evidence-based professional development group to help you advance your learning goals? For example, do you like this webinar format once a month? Or every, you know, on a regular basis? Having these gatherings more often would help. This is a great start, and Beth says. Yeah, finding time to post in discussion lists um, or different platforms is difficult. So finding focus time when we're all together seems certainly um, to work well for our group. That's an observation I've had. Good to hear what other states are doing. Mm -hmm. So Miriam says the webinar is a good start. Perhaps it could be focused on specific topics in later webinars. And that was my thinking, Miriam, you know, that if we had a couple of webinars to get us started just thinking about the world of issues that we face, then we can start creating a plan, maybe even for the year, um, of different focused topics that we want to um, explore in greater depth using formats that seem to work well for most. A 
Okay. Well, we have a couple of minutes left. Um, I would like to point out a few things that are available to you, including the upcoming COIS conference, with, uh, which Federico just mentioned. Um, if you're not in the group right now, this is our platform. This is our spot as a community of practice to really be the home for um, where we find out about resources and where we find out about webinars and where we can post that just-in-time need question to our colleagues. Um, so for this week, remainder of this week, all the way through um, up until the 26th, the guests will be available to answer questions and help us to advance the conversation. I'll be sure to post the questions that we've discussed here and the issues. I'll get to work on that this evening. But in the meantime, please, by all means, feel free to log in um, now and post your question um, to the thread that uh, was created today for the discussion. Um, register for the Part 2 webinar, which is scheduled scheduled for February 9th from 3 to 4.30. Again, we're featuring Texas and Maine, and we're really excited about that. I'd like to uh, give a big thank you to our guests for sharing their time and their expertise and helping us to see, think through the issues. And um, please don't forget to complete Octave's evaluation of professional development activities here at the end. 